Our theme this year is understanding the Acts period. And so we will be discussing the book of Acts and all that goes along with it. You see, at the Word of Truth Ministry, we believe that the book of Acts records the history of a unique time period in God's dealings with mankind. And we believe that Acts is very different from what is going on today. Now, this is not the common belief. We know that the book of Acts is commonly believed to be the beginning of something new. That is, a new religion, the church, or Christendom. And most will claim that the continuation of the book of Acts is today. That what we read in Acts, uh, it ends, people have noticed how suddenly Acts seems to end, and they say, well, that's because what's going on today is just the continuation of Acts. We're doing the same thing. Acts has continued all down through the years up to now. Yet I believe that a realistic assessment of the book of Acts and what was going on then will show that that is not the case. That what is happening today is in fact very, very different from what was happening during the book of Acts. Now I believe that Acts, rather than being the start of something new, was actually a continuation of what the Lord had begun to do in his earthly ministry. And if we look at the beginning of the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, Luke, the author of Acts, writes, The former treatise, and of course he means the Gospel of Luke, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. And so he says that Luke tells what Jesus began to do, and now Acts continues it. So what Jesus began to do in his earthly ministry, not so much in his death, burial, and resurrection, because that, of course, is a complete and finished work, but in his earthly ministry that is recorded in the Gospels, that is continued in the book of Acts. It was the completion of that work and not the beginning of a new one. And the book of Acts is very different from God's work today. Now, the efforts of many today as they attempt to make today to be the continuation of the book of Acts is to take everything in the book of Acts that was high and amazing and unusual and miraculous and reduce it down and down and down so it becomes less and less what is actually recorded. And then they want to take everything that goes on today and that is done today in Christianity and bring it up and up and up. So they're bringing things in Acts down and things today up until they can meet on the same level and say that, that it's all the same thing. However, this is, this is not an honest assessment of the situation, either of the book of Acts or of today. Moreover, there is what sellers call the great theological conspiracy, which is always at work in the Christian church, which is to get the Jew out and to get the Gentile or the church in. And we contend that we can't do this with the book of Acts, that the book of Acts is focused squarely on the people of Israel and on that nation that God chose to be his own. God's kingdom in the book of Acts was spreading throughout the Israelite world. And it was all about the kingdom of God and the nation of Israel. And it was very different in character from what we experience today, where all nations are now equal. It's not all focused on Israel anymore. Now, Otis Q. Sellers contended that there are certain great truths regarding the Acts period that stand out like mountain peaks. And hopefully all you know that Otis Sellers was the founder of the Word of Truth Ministry, our late founder. And he said there are truths regarding Acts stand out like mountain peaks, and without an understanding of these truths, we will never understand the book of Acts and what it's all about. And these truths he set forth in 23 propositions in his tape library number 20, called The Flow of Truth Part 4. And I, so I thought it would be an excellent way to start this conference to review and go through those 23 propositions. Because I believe in, in many of our other talks, we will actually be dealing with the issues brought up in these 23 propositions and hopefully going through some of the proof and some of the evidence that Mr. Sellers would set forth for these 23 propositions. Now, so in this talk, I'm not so much going to be trying to prove these 23 propositions or take you through all the evidence, I'm just setting them forth that this is our view of the Acts period. This is what we believe what was going on in the Acts period. 
And then later in the conference, hopefully we will present a lot of the, the proof and evidence and talk about some of these in more detail. Now, he got these propositions. He, this, their source was from a number of things. First of all, he got these 23 propositions come from the words spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection, as they're recorded in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A second source for these propositions is the book of Acts itself. And as it records the history of the approximately 33 year period that we call the Acts period. A third source is Paul's epistles that were written during this period, which we believe are Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and the book of Romans. And then the fourth source is the book of Hebrews, which records things per proclaimed to the Hebrews during the book of Acts. So from these sources, we would bring forth these 23 propositions that we believe set forth what was going on in the book of Acts. So proposition number one. The 120 disciples assembled at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost were Jews who believed that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah and the Son of God. And these men did not cease to be Jews because of their belief. And of course, that's referring to the great day of Pentecost, as it's set forth in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And then, of course, there came the sound of, from heaven of a rushing mighty wind. The tongues of fire came down and rested upon them. And it says in Acts 2 verse 5, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews devout men out of every nation under heaven. And so it was Jews who were giving the message and Jews who were hearing it. Now notice that he says these men did not cease to be, to be Jews because of their belief in Christ. And Sir Robert Anderson wrote in his book, The Silence of God, on page 85, the divine religion of Judaism, in every part of it, both in the spirit and in the letter, pointed to the coming of a promised Messiah. And to maintain that a man ceased to be a Jew because he cherished that hope and accepted the Messiah when he came, this is a position absolutely grotesque in its absurdity. And with that statement, I would agree. How could you possibly say that a Jew who held the, the cherished hope of Messiah from the Old Testament that when he believed in Messiah when he came, that stopped him from being a Jew. It doesn't make any sense. It's absurd. Proposition number two is that those who heard the word on that great day of Pentecost were also Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So therefore, the, the 3,000 who became believers that day were without exception Jews, devout men, and they remained Jews and devout men after they believed. They did not cease being Jews and become Gentiles. And as Sir Robert Anderson said, that only makes sense. How could cherishing the hope of their Messiah and believing in him when he came, how could that stop them from being Jews when that was supposed to be the hope of Israel? Proposition number three. The salvation-bringing message of God was authorized to every man in Israel from Pentecost onward. Now this was not true in the Gospel period. And let's look at Matthew 17 and verse 9. This was after the Lord and his, had, had shown his three disciples, Peter, James, and John, the great transfiguration vision. It says Matthew 17, 9, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. So at this point, the Lord cut off all testimony. Here these three men had seen the Lord in all his glory. They'd seen him in his parousia glory, talking with Moses and Elijah. And they could have gone out and testified as to who and what the Lord was. But the Lord stopped it and said, Don't tell anyone what you just saw till the Son of Man is risen from the dead. 
So the truth of who Christ was was not authorized yet to the common people, to the Jews. It was, it was shown to a few privileged ones, his disciples, who and what the Lord was. But generally, he stopped all testimony. However, in the Acts period, that changed. And the salvation-bringing message of God was now authorized to all in Israel. And the message was that Jesus, who had appeared to be just a man while he was on earth, he was now presented as an object of faith and offered to Israel as a savior. And forgiveness of sins was promised to all who believed in him. From now on, this salvation-bringing message could be spoken by any believing Israelite who was commissioned by God to do so. And this is very important. We believe that in the Acts period, those who proclaimed the gospel were commissioned by God to do it. Now this commission always consisted of the word of God coming to that Israelite and coming to him as a message intended for others. And an example of this from the gospel period, in Luke 3 and verse 2, It says, during this time, Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priests, it says, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching or proclaiming the baptism of repentance. So here a word of God came to John the baptizer, and he took it and he carried it to others. And that was how the gospel was always spoken in the Acts period. And, and Israelite was commissioned by God to receive the word and carry it to others. And every believing Jew in the Acts period had the blessing of this experience. That is, of either being the one to whom the word of God came to give it to others, or being one of those who was privileged to have the word of God sent to them. I'm not necessarily saying that every single Jew carried it, but every single Jew either was commissioned to carry it or had a commission for it to be taken to him, for him to receive it. So they were either, either receiving the word from another or being given the word to give to others. Every Jew in the Acts period was on one side or the other of this experience. Proposition number four. For eight years between the day of Pentecost and Peter's visit to the house of Cornelius, every believer was a Jew. Now suppose there was a Gentile standing on the edge of a crowd of Jews and listening as one of these God-commissioned Israelites stood up and proclaimed the gospel. And he overheard it. Could he believe it? Become a believer in the gospel? Well, no. Because the, the message was not to him. The author of salvation, the author of Christ as Messiah, was not to Gentiles. And even if a Gentile overheard it, the message wasn't to him. And it would be no more relevant to him than if, if I overheard someone making wedding vows. <laughs> well, it <laughs> doesn't mean they're making the vows to me, just because I heard them. Now some might say, well, wait a minute, what about the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8? He was a Gentile. Well, wait, he was going up to Israel to worship at the temple. See, he was a proselyte to the Jewish religion. And that means he counted as an Israelite. So proselytes were, were considered as Israelites. But a Gentile, someone who was not a proselyte, no. Not a single Gentile believed during the eight years between Pentecost and Peter's visit to the house of Cornelius. Proposition number five. The thrice repeated vision that Peter saw on the housetop in Acts chapter 10 was a special commission or authorization or direction for him to go to Cornelius, a Gentile. Now this was a case of a man being authorized to go to a Gentile and not the message being authorized to go to Gentiles. 
Now this proclamation that Peter made when he went to the house of, household of Cornelius was a proclamation to that one household. And that represents Peter's entire Acts period ministry to Gentiles. And Peter did not proclaim to Gentiles after that. Otherwise, if he did, as many people think, oh, this threw the door open and Peter proclaimed to Gentiles as well as Jews from then on. Well, if that was the case, then Paul was not the apostle to the Gentiles. Because Peter was an apostle to the Gentiles as well. But no, Peter was not apostle to the Gentiles. That was Paul. Peter received one special commission to one household, and that was it. So Peter's commission to the household of Cornelius prepared the Israelite believers for Paul's ministry six years later, when he would start to proclaim the gospel to Gentiles. Proposition number six. Cornelius did not become a herald of the salvation-bringing message to other Gentiles. This is what many people imagine. Oh, after Cornelius believed, he must have been all excited, and he went back to Rome, and he searched out all his friends, and he searched out everyone he could find, and he spread the gospel to them, and the gospel spread around Rome because of Cornelius. Well, no. No, Cornelius may have wished he could do that, but he couldn't do that without a divine commission. See, that's the way it was in the Acts period. You had to receive a commission from God in order to proclaim the gospel. And the fact is that Paul was the only man whom God commissioned to proclaim Christ to the Gentiles in the Acts period, with the one exception of Peter's one-time commission to the household of Cornelius. Otherwise, Paul was the commissioned one to the Gentiles. And if it wasn't Paul proclaiming it, then no one else could proclaim to Gentiles. Not Cornelius, not anyone else. Proposition number seven. It was God's purpose, intention, and program in Acts that every man, woman, and responsible child in Israel should hear the salvation bringing gospel and have a clear cut opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus as the Messiah and as their personal Savior. And this extended from the land of Israel to the uttermost part of the earth. See, God was seeking out every single Israelite around the world. And the Israelites had been scattered. They've been scattered for centuries at this point. Some of them have been out of the land for centuries. And yet they were still, I call them ancestral Israelites. They had never, many of them had never been in the land of Israel, had never set foot on its soil, had no citizenship in Israel. They were citizens of other nations. And yet their ancestors were Israelites. And God was seeking out each and every one of these to see to it that, that every man, woman, and responsible child had the opportunity to hear the gospel of Christ and believe it. That was God's purpose and intention in the Acts period. Proposition number eight. This purpose was accomplished. And every single Israelite around the world was covered. Now you might say, how could, how could they possibly do that? How could they cover every single Israelite outside the land? Well, understand it, it might not have been as hard as you might think. Because the fact is that Israelites, in every place they lived, they tended to live together in communities, in pockets. They would all live in the same area, the Jewish quarter. And in many ways, they, they had to, almost had to do this. You see, the, the culture, we might say, of the Roman Empire was largely a pagan culture. The people were all pagans. They all worshipped many gods. They were polytheists. They worshipped in the same way. They worshipped idols. And they all lived the same sort of lifestyle, and they had the same sort of morality and, and the same sort of view of life and of the world. And the only real counterculture there was, was that of the Israelites, was that of the Jews, was that that God had given in the Old Testament. So they were the only counterculture that existed. So needless to say, the vast majority of people looked down on them as being the only ones who lived different and thought different and worshiped different. So it was very difficult to be a counterculture. And so in many cases, it was a matter of we all hang together or else we'll all hang separately. So they had to live together in community. And most of them did. 
And so all you had to do was to go to these community centers where all the Jews would hang out and you'd come in contact with all of them very easily. And then after you'd gotten the major vast majority of them who lived in those community centers, then you could maybe go and, and seek out those few who were perhaps outside the community and find them. But it really wouldn't have been so hard as we might think when they all lived together in these communities. So often just by going to the synagogue, you could reach the vast majority of the Jews in that, in that area. And we believe that that's what happened. They accomplished that purpose. They reached every Jew in Israel in the Acts period. And every Jew outside Israel, every Jew outside the land in the Acts period as well. So proposition number nine. In the Acts period, the presentation of the gospel was done only by God-commissioned and God-authorized men. It was always spoken by divine inspiration and was always absolute truth. And that's very different from the way it is today. Today we try to learn the gospel and study the gospel and understand the gospel and repeat it as best we can. But many times when the gospel is given, it's given mixed in with, with misunderstandings, it's given mixed in with errors, uh, it's given from perspectives that, that are, are different from the Bibles and different from the truth. There's, the gospel is there, but it's mixed in with a lot of other things. And it's mixed in with a lot of human ideas. But that was never the way it was in the Acts period. Because the gospel and what was given was always given by inspiration of God, so it was always absolutely true. Now in the Acts period, the gospel was never written. It wasn't written down because it wasn't meant to just go out to everybody. It was only meant to go out through these commissioned men. So you couldn't write it down because what would be the use? Anybody who picked it up and read it couldn't believe it anyway because it hadn't been commissioned to them, hadn't been authorized to them. Not only this, but the gospel was never memorized and spoken over and over. Often when we repeat the gospel, we can almost do it by rote, right? We've, we've come to know the gospel. We, we understand how you share it, and, and we do it just almost memorized, automatically say the words. And we speak it over and over. And yet that was not the way it was in the Acts period. Every time the gospel was spoken in Acts, it was coming fresh from God. Freshly inspired by him. Now therefore, because God was inspiring it every time, he could tailor it to suit the needs of the audience. He could look into the hearts and minds of the audience and know exactly what this audience needed and tailor the gospel to that audience's needs. However, these variations, any variation in the way the gospel was presented came from God. It didn't come from the speaker and, and what he thought was needed for this crowd and what he thought might be best. And No, no, God was making the variations. So because the gospel was coming straight from God in this way, it was inspired by God every time it was spoken, one man could proclaim it just as well as another. The ability of the one proclaiming it didn't come into the picture because it was God inspiring it every time. So that meant whether the person was an ignorant fisherman or an educated statesman, it didn't matter. The gospel would be spoken just as authoritatively, just as correctly, and just as powerfully, no matter who was speaking it. Proposition number 10. This Acts period work was a work that was to be performed very quickly. God intended the gospel to go out to every Israelite around the world, and our best estimates were, is there were about 8 million Israelites around the world at this time, both Israelites in the land and ancestral Israelites outside of it. But this work was to be done very quickly. And therefore, in order to avoid all delays, all misunderstandings, and any need for translation, the gospel of Christ was always spoken in the pure mother tongue of the one for whom it was intended. And this was through the gift of tongues in the Acts period. The gift of tongues is about proclaiming the gospel in the native language, the mother tongue of all those who heard. Now there are those today, of course, who try to make out that the gift of tongues is active today and it's a babble. But of course that doesn't help the gospel go out to anyone. And the fact was that the gift of tongues in the Acts period of tongue is a language. 
Your mother tongue is the language your mother taught you, that you grew up learning. And the gift of tongues in the Acts period was the gift of a language that you maybe never learned, never knew before, and yet God suddenly gave you that language as a gift, gave it into your mind. And therefore, those who spread the gospel in the Acts period could spread the gospel not only were the words inspired, but even the language could be inspired. They could be given the language to speak it in the mother tongue of those who heard. Proposition number 11. In the Acts period, the proclamation of the gospel was always confirmed to the hearers by signs. And we can see this in Mark chapter 16, verses 19 through 20. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 19, it says, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and proclaimed everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So as those apostles went out and declared the word, the word was confirmed by signs following. Now those signs might come before the presentation of the gospel. Like in Acts chapter 3, where Peter and John healed the lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple and then presented the gospel. Or it could be that the gospel was presented first and then the signs followed. Like when Paul and Barnabas were in Iconium and were proclaiming the gospel and then they saw the lame man and healed him. So the sign came after the presentation of the gospel. But whether the sign was before or after the presentation of the gospel, the signs were always there. And that means that in the Acts period, no one was asked to believe without seeing. They were all given proof, they were all given evidence, they were all given signs to show that the gospel was true. Proposition number 12. In the Acts period, a man was given only one opportunity to hear the message and have Christ presented to him. And this is entirely different than it is today. We realize today, and with, with the gospel not proven by signs and not always given flawlessly and straight from God, there are people who can hear the gospel and hear it and hear it. Maybe it doesn't drive home to their hearts or, or maybe they say, well, maybe sometime in the future I don't want to come to God now because I'm having too good a time and maybe I'll come to God when I'm old. They might reject it over and over and over, and yet sometime, finally, they are convicted in their hearts and believe the gospel. But that's not the way it was in the Acts period. They had one chance to accept, and that was it. Now, Paul may speak at once and then go back to teach the believers, but the heralds of the gospel never spoke it to the same people twice. Why would that be? Well, the thing is, if you could hear a God-inspired message, again, not just someone fumblingly trying to share the gospel as best they can, but a God-inspired message, a message confirmed with signs following, showing that this, this person is coming from God and proclaiming the truth. And then the Holy Spirit was always present to bring that gospel home to the hearts of those for whom it was intended. If after all that, a man could quibble about it and argue against it and say, no, I don't think so, or what about this detail or that, and, and, and wouldn't want to hear it, and rejected it, well, there was nothing more that God could do. If God had done all this and that wasn't enough, what more could God possibly do? Proposition number 13. Since a firm foundation for faith was laid in the proclamation of the message, God expected belief to be instantaneous. There was nothing to think over or consider. God had spoken through his mediator to his people and confirmed it with signs following. There was only one question to be settled instantaneously, what the hearer would do about it. Now this is Mr. Sellers uh, proposition number 13 and I might like to put a few uh, a caveat on that 
and say that uh, I'll be talking later in this conference about, uh, about this one and saying that maybe, well, I do absolutely agree with Mr. Sellers that there was one chance to believe and if you rejected it, you weren't given another chance. I'm not so sure that that, that chance is always just instantaneous, that sometimes I think God did give them time to think about it. Uh, for example, in Acts, we have the statement that Paul proclaimed the gospel for three months and then some people started to reject it, which seems to take a little longer than instantaneous. But we'll talk about that one a little later. Uh, this is Mr. Sellers' proposition. And certainly I do absolutely agree that they had one chance to believe in Acts, and if they rejected, that was it. For proposition number 14, in the Acts period, the faith of a believer was always publicly accredited and confirmed by God. Signs did follow those who believed. And again in Mark chapter 16, where the Lord said, starting in verse 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach or proclaim the gospel in every creation. It would be better than to every creature. Proclaim the gospel in every creation. He that believeth and is baptized or identified shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. And notice that this is important. The signs follow those who believed. You know, there's plenty of people today who will tell you, you need to go out and follow these signs. You need to follow speaking in tongues. Uh, you need to follow these signs. But this doesn't say you need to follow the signs. It says the signs will follow them. And when something's following you, you can't get away from it. You can run, it stays behind you. You, have, you can't get away. It's following you. It's not a matter that you have to seek out something that's following you. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues, new languages. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. That protected them from assassination. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So these signs followed those who believed. Again, they didn't have to follow them. The signs followed them, not the other way around. Now that meant that who was a believer was open and obvious. And there was no question about it. Now this is not the way it is today. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3, we read of believers today, after the Acts period, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Now the fact is that in Christ we have life. And yet as someone who in Christ has life, there's no tongue of fire hanging over my head to show people that I have life in Christ. There's no miraculous sign to prove it. No, my life is hid with Christ in God. And as believers, we, we oftentimes will recognize each other. But that's because we see maybe in the person's life and in their heart and in their words, the fact that they're a believer. But there is no sign to prove it. And there might be times we're deceived about someone being a believer or not. We think someone is and, and they're not. They're faking it. But that's because there's no sign. The life of a believer today is hid with Christ in God. But that was not true of the ex period believers. Their life was open and obvious. And you could see it. There was a sign to prove it. Proposition number 15. After Peter's divinely commissioned visit to Cornelius, Paul was the only man commissioned of God to the Gentiles. And of course, I mean in the Acts period. And we can see that in Romans chapter 11 and verse 13. In Romans chapter 11 and verse 13, Paul writes, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. So Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles in the Acts period. The apostle to the Gentiles. 
And as we said, with the one exception of Peter and the one household that he was sent to, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And of course, that was after Peter, right? Some six years after Peter, when Paul became the apostle to the Gentiles. And he was the only one. No one else was authorized to carry the gospel to any Gentile but Paul in the Acts period. However, even though Paul was commissioned to the Gentiles, proposition number 16, Paul's ministry in the Acts period was always to the Jew first. And we can see this in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Where Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And that word first indicates priority. It's not just order. It's also priority. To the Jews, we might say primarily, and only secondarily to the Greek. So the result was that even though Paul was commissioned to carry the gospel to the Gentiles, if Paul and his companions came upon a city that had no company of Jews in it, they would simply pass that city by. We can see that in Acts chapter 17 and verse 1. This is during Paul's so-called second missionary journey. I call it a second apostolic journey. But in Acts 17 verse 1 it says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So here Paul and his companions come to Amphipolis, a town full of Gentiles, a town where he could have proclaimed Gentiles, but he passed right by. He came to Apollonia, another town full of people, passed right by. He came to Thessalonica, where there were Jews. There he stopped and proclaimed. So during the Acts period, there were thousands of divinely commissioned heralds who carried the salvation-bringing message of God to every Israelite around the world. But only one lone herald took the gospel to the Gentiles. And he did that only after he had fulfilled every obligation to his own people of Israel. So the result of this was that there were very few Gentiles saved. There were Gentiles saved, but it was very few. And the way most people try to make out in Acts, it was mostly Gentiles and only a few Jews. But this was not the case. With only one herald taking it to Gentiles, and with him only doing it after he proclaimed to Jews first, there were actually very few Gentiles saved in the Acts period. Proposition number 17. It was the man Paul who was commissioned to the Gentiles and not the salvation bringing message. While God could save a Gentile, Paul became the mediator to carry the message to that Gentile. And that means that the great principle of one mediator, mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, was not true at that time. We, and this is in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, which reads, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So while this was true, is true now, it was not true then. God was using mediators. The apostles were all mediators. Everyone who carried the salvation bringing message in the Acts period was a mediator between God and men. It was men being commissioned as mediators and not the gospel going out and Christ the only mediator. Proposition number 18. In the Acts period, the children of Israel are described as to number as being like the sand of the sea. And this is in Romans chapter 9 and verse 27. 
Romans 9.27. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. That's Isaiah, of course. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. So these Israelites were like the sand of the sea. Our best estimate might be around 8 million Israelites living around the world. 2.5 million in the land, 5.5 million outside. But th those, of course, are rough numbers. They were like the sand of the sea. Who can count the exact number? Now, God's purpose in the 33-year period of Acts was to test every grain of sand. Every single individual Israelite was to be tested, was to receive the gospel proclamation, and was to receive their test at the hand of God. Now the result would be that many of these grains of sand, many of these Israelites around the world, would prove to be diamonds, who would shine forth the moment they heard the message and saw its confirmation through the signs. Now calling them diamonds, I'm getting that from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 17. The Lord, speaking of Israel in the kingdom of God, says, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. So someday God is going to make up his jewels out of the nation of Israel. And this will include everyone in the Acts period, every Israelite in the Acts period who heard the gospel and believed it. Now, because these men were his jewels and belonged to God, they knew the Lord's voice the instant they heard it. As the Lord said in John chapter 10 and verse 27, the Lord Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And so when the gospel came to these Jews around the world, they heard his voice, and they knew him, and they followed him. Proposition number 19. At the close of the Acts period, God had accomplished everything he had set out to do. The message had gone to the ends of the earth. Every Israelite heard. A remnant, a remainder was established. And also, a small company for his name was called from among the Gentiles. Now at this point, the early blade stage of the kingdom was over. And I'm getting that from the parable in Mark chapter 4, where the Lord gave a parable of the kingdom of God in Mark 4.26. And he said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. So here we have a parable of the kingdom of God that presents the kingdom of God like the stages of growing grain. And the grain grows, and first there's the blade, just poking up out of the ground. Then the ear starts to develop, the ear of grain. After that, the full grain in the ear, the grain is fully developed, it's fully there. Then the fruit is brought forth, the grain is ripened, and then the sickle is authorized because harvest has come, the harvest. So we have five stages of growing grain, and the kingdom is compared to that. Now the blade stage, I believe, of the kingdom was the Acts period. So I've said that the Acts period was not something new and that it was the start of a new religion or the start of Christendom or the church. It was the continuation of the Lord's earthly ministry. But remember, the Lord's earthly ministry, the message was... The kingdom of God is at hand. In many ways, the, in, in the Acts period, the message was the kingdom of God is here. But it was here in its early blade stage. And so, from that sense, it was something new. It was the start of the kingdom, not just the kingdom being at hand. But at the end of Acts, the blade stage was over, and the manifest kingdom was ready to burst on mankind. That is, it was about to become obvious to everyone. At first, in the Acts period, only those who believed understood they were in the kingdom. 
But the full kingdom was about to burst forth and announce itself to the world. But then everything was suspended. Well, God moved to accomplish a purpose never before revealed. A purpose carried out in a dispensation or a, a period of grace. So since the work of the Acts period was suspended, the truths of the Acts period may or may not be applicable to today. I'm not saying that everything changed. The gospel is still the same. Of course, the Lord Jesus is still the same. But some of the truths of the Acts period and these special propositions we've been sending forth are no longer true, no longer the same today. Proposition number 20. The salvation-bringing message of God was authorized, that is, it was made freely available to the Gentiles, to all nations, by Paul's declaration in Acts 28 and verse 28. And from that moment forth, any believer in Jesus Christ, as long as he knows the salvation-bringing message, can freely freely proclaim the gospel of Christ to anyone without hindrance, restriction, or priority. So it's no longer necessary for a proclaimer of the gospel to be commissioned by God because the gospel itself is authorized to all. And anyone can take it up and anyone can proclaim it. And I've used the example that someone who knew the gospel could write a play and write the gospel into the lines of the play. And then they cast for the play and some actor gets the part of the person who spreads the gospel. And the actor memorizes the lines and gives the lines and the actor doesn't believe the gospel himself. He's just an actor who has that part in the play. But he gives the gospel in his lines in the play and someone hears the gospel from this actor and believes it. Even though the one who said the gospel didn't believe it himself. He was just an actor saying his lines. Well, the power is not in the messenger. It's not in the one saying the gospel now. It's in the gospel itself. Anyone can pick up the gospel and proclaim it, and anyone who hears can believe it. So this taking up the gospel and freely proclaiming it without hindrance, restriction, or priority has been done and is still being done. And no one today has to go to the Jew first, as Paul did. Proposition number 21. In Acts 28, 28, God guaranteed that the Gentiles would hear this message. That is, that it would get through to them. Well, to make this good, the message had to be put in writing, making it the possession of all. Since it was no longer true that God was going to divinely inspire the gospel every time it was given, it was now dependent on the messengers to proclaim it as best they could. And if we just depended on the messengers, the gospel could have quickly been lost, quickly forgotten, quickly so garbled that it was no longer recognizable or believable. So it was necessary for it to be written down so that it wouldn't be lost. So proposition number 22. This writing down of the gospel is found in the book that God caused to be written so that anyone who reads it might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing might have life through his name. And that book, we believe, is the Gospel of John. And this, I believe, was the first book authorized by God after Acts 28, 28, was the Gospel of John. Now, proposition number 23. God's word never returns to him void. John was intended to produce believers. Let's look at John chapter 20 and verse 31. If we start in John 20 and verse 30, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, verse 31, but these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. And that ye there, which is an old English form of you, has no antecedent. 
And that means it's speaking to the reader. The author here is focusing on the reader, not on anyone in the gospel, and saying, you, reader, this is written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that you might have life through his name. So John was intended to produce believers. It has produced believers, and it continues to produce believers. Now these believers were now in a new company. It was no longer the Acts period company of believers, but a new company produced as a result of a God-inspired book rather than as the result of God-inspired men. And these are therefore the blessed ones who believe without seeing, according to John 20 and verse 29. When Jesus said to, unto him, Thomas, speaking to Thomas, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So the company who believes today the gospel without signs and wonders and an inspired apostle proclaiming it, they are the company of the blessed ones who have believed without seeing. Now understanding that Acts 28.28 28 is the dividing line and that it brought the Acts period and its unique conditions to an end, this helps explain, or actually it does explain, it doesn't just help, it explains Acts' abrupt ending, which many have noted and been unable to explain. And as I've said, some try to explain it by saying, oh, that's just because we're the continuation of Acts today. Well, no. In the last portion of Acts, we see Paul arrested by a Jerusalem mob in Acts chapter 21. In Acts chapter 24, Paul goes on trial before the man Felix, who didn't give him justice because he was hoping for a bribe. Then in Acts chapter 25, Paul appeared on trial before the new governor, Festus, who wanted to turn him over to his enemies. So Paul had to appeal to Caesar. Now, Acts chapters 27 through 28 are about his journey to Rome to appear before Caesar. And in Acts 27 and verse 24, the angel of God appears to Paul and says to him, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. This is while Paul was in the storm at sea. He says, you have to appear before Caesar so you're not going to drown in this storm and God has as a gift given you everybody who's sailing with you. They won't drown either. So you have to appear before Caesar and that seems to be the whole focus of the end of Acts is Paul going to appear before Caesar. And yet after Acts 28, 28, the book of Acts ends abruptly without any visit before Caesar being recorded. In Acts 28, verse 29, after Paul says, be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And that's the end of the book. And next we go on to Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans. There's no word anywhere ever of Paul appearing before Caesar. So why did Acts seem to have this focus on Paul heading to appear before Caesar and then never give it? And just end so abruptly. Well, this ending that is so strange to the majority of Christians is easily explained once we understand the fact that Acts is recording the acts of God's commissioned men, his apostles. He was commissioning them to carry the gospel, and it's the story of how they did it. And when we understand that at Acts 28, 28, the acts of the God-commissioned men ended when God commissioned, when he authorized the gospel itself, and from now on it was no longer going to be about commissioned men carrying the gospel, it was going to be about the gospel going out to anyone who could hear it and anyone who would proclaim it. Well, we can see why Acts ended where it did. It ended because the Acts of the Apostles ended. Because that period ended. Because now everything was going to be different. So this strange end of the book is not so strange. It, in fact, makes perfect sense when we understand that Acts 28, 28 ended the Acts period. And ended the Acts of the Apostles. <clears throat> 
So we believe that the Acts period was a unique, separate period in the works of God. Its focus was on Israel. The gospel was proclaimed then, and though it was the same gospel as is proclaimed today, it was proclaimed by God-commissioned men. It was inspired straight from God every time they proclaimed it. And it was always followed by signs. You were never expected to believe it, just on God's word for it. The gospel was largely to the Jews, with only a small company of Gentile believers. Acts record the acts of these commissioned men, and it ended when the salvation-bringing message itself was commissioned and authorized to all in Acts 28, 28, which resulted in the gospel being written down for us to read it and believe it today. The ending of Acts is not abrupt, but it reflects the end of this unique period. So this is an introduction to the Acts period, and many of these propositions we'll be considering in more detail in future talks. But that's our, our introduction and our propositions concerning Acts.